Silent Mermaid, a retelling of The Little Mermaid Part 3 by Brittany Fichter. Copyright 2017. Chapter 21. Shimmers. Michael smiled wryly to himself as he rode them out to the center of the bay. How many times had his mother begged and pleaded and cajoled him to woo some girl out in this very boat or anywhere for that matter? And now he was out with the one girl in the world that his mother couldn't stand. But he wasn't wooing. He was only helping her recover from a scare. It was the chivalrous thing to do. I used to bring Claire out here often, he said as he rode. After her parents died she had nightmares. Sometimes we would come out here in the middle of the night just so she could fall asleep in the boat. Ariana watched him, and Michael couldn't help fancying that he saw some warmth in her eyes. Not that it mattered if he did. Because he wasn't wooing. She had stopped shaking at least, but the sorrow still hadn't left her face. She reached down and trailed a hand in the water as they went, her fingers moving over its surface like a caress. He almost asked if she missed the ocean, but checked himself first. They'd come out here to make her feel better, not to remind her of all she'd left behind. This half of the bay technically belongs to Destin, but King Everard has been kind enough to give us full use of it, as there are no Destinian villages nearby. Its fish are the only reason we've survived this long without trade, he said instead, bringing the boat to rest beneath a hanging tree. Ariana looked up at the tree and frowned slightly before turning and squinting back at the peninsula across the bay. Michael chuckled. We can't understand it either. Destin is full of evergreen forests, and our little piece of land is as tropical as they come. All we can surmise is that the Maker wanted it that way for a reason. But that's not what we're here to talk about. He laid his oars inside the boat and placed a hand beneath his chin. We're here to talk about you. Ariana blinked at him a few times before raising an eyebrow. It's a game I play with Claire and Lucy. Just, indulge me. She shrugged, but a little smile surfaced. Here's how it works. I ask questions, and you answer me either a yes or a no, and I have to guess what you mean. At this, her blue eyes lit up, and she sat up straighter. Her eyes shimmered, Michael realized, like the sun glinting off ocean waves. For some reason this made him happy, and suddenly he was aware of a truth that he probably would have seen long ago, had he not been so wrapped up in his own problems. Ariana wanted desperately to be heard. I know you had a brother. I believe you had a sister as well. She nodded so emphatically that a curl escaped her hair's tight knot. Michael laughed. Very good then. I will proceed now to guess her name. In actuality, he had met her sister several times, and he was fairly sure her name was Layla or Lily or something similar, but the look on Ariana's face now was brighter than he'd ever seen it, so he continued on with his silly game. Is it Mildred? She made a face. Daphne? She wagged her finger at him. Audra? A roll of the eyes. Well, if I'm doomed to get it wrong, then perhaps you can at least tell me what she's like. Ariana pulled her hand from the water and stared at it thoughtfully for a long moment. Then she placed her hands delicately on her cheeks and gracefully pulled her hands off. She's often embarrassed. Ariana leaned forward and slapped his arm. Michael laughed again. Ah, you're saying she was lovely. Another emphatic nod. Was she as lovely as you? Her smile disappeared, and she turned to stare out over the bay, fingering her shell necklace as she did. Ariana, Michael whispered, was she as lovely as you? He reached out and tugged on her shoulder until she was facing him again. In just a few flustered motions, Ariana confirmed what Michael had feared. There's something I should have told you months ago, he said, readjusting his position since it seemed they were going to be in the boat for a while. His silly game seemed to have opened up a wound that, had he pulled his head from the dirt earlier, he should have seen long before. The night your brother died, he began, I had one last conversation with him. She sat up straighter, so Michael continued. He pulled me aside and told me about you. 
My father doesn't want the sun crown to know, he said, but I get the strange feeling tonight that someone ought to know. As Michael recalled the moment now, he felt a chill run down his neck. Ronaldo couldn't have known just how important that premonition had been. Michael swallowed hard before continuing. My youngest sister is different from the rest of us, he told me. She can't sing or even talk, and her health grows more frail the deeper she gets in the ocean. But she's special. She sees and hears things no one else notices. And she's determined to live. Michael paused. Ariana's eyes were closed, and tears were streaming down her face. Michael scooted forward in the boat and took her hand before whispering, he told me that he was convinced you might one day be the sea crown. Ariana's eyes shot open, and she stared at him as though he'd lost his mind. Then, pulling her hand free, she looked up into the hanging branches above them and opened and closed her mouth before shrugging and shaking her head, tears falling even faster. Her shoulders slumped forward like a little old woman's, and she placed her face in her hands. Michael leaned forward. I didn't know him as well as you did, but I got to know your brother well enough over the years to know he was a man of honor. I didn't understand what he meant that day, but I knew that if nothing else, he had faith in what the Maker could do with you. Michael paused, unsure of how to finish his awkward speech. He was a good man, he finally said. And he didn't deserve to die so young. So much for making her feel better. Or himself. And yet, Michael wasn't sorry for what he had said. This connection should have been made long ago, if not for any other reason than out of respect for Ronaldo. He deserved to be remembered with dignity. I think I liked him so much because in a lot of ways, he reminded me of my sister, Mora. She was like him, always knew what she was doing. Unlike Michael. Michael suddenly had to look away for the strange prick in his eyes. When he looked up at the sky, he noticed that the sun had peaked, and he knew without a doubt that they would be missed at the midday meal. He should have been back at the palace nearly a half hour before. Still, he had one more question. Did you know who I was the day you rescued me? Slowly, Ariana nodded, her eyes wary, and Michael recalled the sailor's words. Had Ariana watched him often, as the sailor claimed? The thought was a bit unsettling at first, until Michael also remembered what Ronaldo had said about Ariana's limitations. A mermaid without the ability to dive deep or sing must have led a lonely existence indeed. Now as they sat in the shade of the tree, Ariana leaned over the side of the boat and placed her hand in the water. The water rippled as two pretty little blue and yellow fish surfaced, nibbling the end of her finger. What have they told you, he wondered, to make your self-loathing so great? But he didn't ask that. Instead, he asked, want to see how fast I can row us before we tip over into the bay? Ariana splashed him hard, and Michael laughed. After rowing them back to the other side of the bay, Michael held out his hand to help her up from the boat. When she was standing on the dock beside him, however, he suddenly found it very difficult to let go. Warning bells, like the ones the church told when a fire had begun, sounded in his head as he stared at their clasped hands. For a moment, he had forgotten his angst. He had forgotten his country's situation and even his own problems. For a single second, there had been Ariana. Only Ariana. Such thinking was dangerous, particularly for a prince who was barely maintaining a hold on his own kingdom. This was the worst time to be trailing after a woman. And yet, he found he wanted more than an occasional smile and nod. He wanted to keep her close. He wanted to hear her. Michael was in a precarious place. Chapter 22 Accusations I still cannot see why three and seven make ten, Lucy sighed as they took their seats in the dining hall. All these figures hurt my head. Then she perked up as Rolf handed her some silverware. Perhaps there will be date cakes tonight. That would make my head hurt less. We haven't had date cakes in over a year, Claire said as she took her seat beside her sister. And it doesn't matter if the sum makes sense. Three and seven make ten. They just do. 
Your head just hurts because of your sniffles. Ariana sighed a little. It would be so much easier to teach the children if she could talk. They were both quick, and she was honestly amazed that they had learned anything under her tutelage. Renata would have known what to do. The thought took Ariana a bit by surprise, and with it came the pang of guilt she still felt whenever her aunt's face appeared in her mind. Ariana. Girls. The cook nodded to each of them as he began to ladle the supper into their bowls. Ariana tried to keep a smile on her face as she saw the watery chatter splatter at the bottom of her bowl. Clams again. But at least she had food, she rebuked herself immediately. Her face wasn't gaunt or ashen like the humans had been in the city. And as she was feeling guilty about her dislike of chowder, more guilt poured in, as it often did when she had moments of weakness. It had been two weeks since her last attempt at finding her aunt, the very day she'd been attacked by the old fisherman. For a time she had gone out now in total, and each trip had been cut shorter, thanks to the ever-encroaching monsters from the deeps. That, and her fins were taking longer and longer to change in and out each time. Whatever magic had given her legs seemed to be slowly draining itself from her. Another gift of the maker, she thought wryly. The table quieted as Michael took his seat. He turned to the holy man and asked him to give the blessing, and while everyone else prayed, Ariana studied the tops of their heads. As always, Bethia and Rolf held hands. Ariana smiled wistfully as their fingers, dark on white, entwined peacefully. The queen looked as proper as ever, her fine brown and white peppered hair up in an elaborate twist and sprinkled with little jewels. Cook's round face was still red from the heat of the stove, and so was his daughter's, who helped him. The footman and one of the two maids held hands, too, a habit they had taken up the week before but never let anyone see after the prayer ended. Master Russo seemed to be getting the same bad cold that had kept Ariana and the girls indoors for the last week, as he continually sniffled during the prayer. And Lucas, well, he seemed to be as late as ever. A movement to her left a few chairs down caught her eye, and Ariana found herself staring into the eyes of the eldest prince. Gently, he nodded at the holy man, who was still praying, then closed his eyes again. Embarrassed, Ariana ducked her head. Her relationship with Michael had been much easier since their boat ride. She had even been invited to the prince's study each night, and while he argued with Lucas or Russo, she sat in her little corner and checked his figures. It was a peaceful time, and while they rarely talked during such sessions, there was something nice about sitting nearby and knowing another soul was there. She wasn't about to pledge her allegiance to a maker who hated her, but she didn't want another bit of consternation between herself and the prince either. Whatever truce they seemed to have struck up was already confusing enough. As soon as the prayer was over, everyone tucked into their food, though it was with less enthusiasm than they had when Ariana had first arrived. Cook struck up a lively debate on whether or not clams should be baked or fried. Ariana knew next to nothing of cooking. Still, everyone else seemed interested, probably because there was little else to discuss. Everyone else but Prince Michael. He stared at his food listlessly as he stirred the white watery soup continuously with his spoon. Ariana suddenly found herself missing his smile. He was generally serious, but in the last few weeks, Ariana had seen him smile less and less until his false grins were reserved only for the girls. Now one dark brow was pulled down over his hazel eyes, and he seemed even more gone than usual. Something was wrong. Something was always wrong, Ariana tried to chide herself. But she couldn't escape the nagging feeling that a dark cloud was looming over their heads. If she could speak, Ariana decided, she would draw him aside and demand to know what had happened. And he would tell her. She was sure of it. Actually, she wasn't sure. But as she stirred her own chowder, Ariana wished she were sure. There had been something in his eyes that day on the pier, something she would have paid a thousand gold pieces to see again. 
and every now and then, as she played with the girls in the garden or worked with them on their numbers and writing, she sometimes thought she saw it in his eyes whenever she glanced up and saw him watching them. But she was just being silly. He was watching his nieces. Nothing else. Probably making sure they were being well cared for and keeping up with their studies. Just at that moment, however, Ariana had the sensation of being watched. When she looked up, she realized with a start that Michael was looking at her with the same undeniable intensity he'd been observing her with for weeks. Her breath caught in her throat, and for the first time it occurred to Ariana that the prince could be just as silent as she. If no one else were there to judge or advise him, what would he say? Would she get to hear his real voice? Michael. Queen Dina's grating voice jarred both of them out of their shared moment. Ariana wanted to pinch the woman. But the prince just sighed and turned to his mother, who was sitting to his immediate right, a careful smile plastered on his face. Yes, mother? What will you be doing tonight? Going over Lucas's plans to repair our flagship. Why? Won't you be examining our finances as well? Ariana forgot to breathe. Where was she going with this? I have it from a very good source, Queen Dina sniffed, that you've been receiving help with that task. Yes, Michael's words were cautious. He leaned back and studied his mother with wary eyes. What of it? Is the girl helping you? Their entire party went silent, and Ariana had to suppress the desire to crawl under the table. The way the queen said it made her quiet evenings in the prince's study feel suddenly shameful, though she couldn't say just why. I thought, the queen continued, putting her spoon down and turning to glare at Ariana, that I had made my feelings clear about her dabbling in her coffers. Also, she turned back to her son, I thought we had taught you better than to consort with young women alone. Mother! Michael's mouth fell open. My door is open to anyone who wishes to see me in the evenings. You know this. Besides, he gestured at Ariana, which only made her blush more, she is very good with her figures. Far better than me, actually. She's already saved us more coin than I ever did. I was getting four hours of sleep a night, and thanks to Ariana, I'm now getting five. He stood up so fast his chair fell over. If you had listened to me that night, you would have seen it, too. Oh, I'm sure she is very good with her figure. That is enough. Michael threw down his napkin. If you wish to have this conversation with me, you may do so in private. But do not try to tarnish her character here in front of our friends. The queen huffed and stuck her lip out in a ludicrous pout, but Michael wasn't finished. When have I ever shirked duty? When, mother? He righted his chair and began to stalk off. Wait, Michael. I am still queen here. You will respect me. But Michael only slammed the door. The spacious glass room was filled with a nearly stifling silence. Finally, her head held high, the queen stood, too. No one said a word as she began to walk. She stopped, however, when she got to Ariana's chair. Ariana smelled the faint scent of jasmine as Dina bent so close that their faces nearly touched. He may be blind to your wiles, but I know what kind of trickery you're harboring, she hissed, making Ariana's ear hurt. I am warning you now. Stay away from my son. I forbid you from visiting his study tonight or ever again. And should you be tempted to disobey me, she touched Ariana's necklace, do not forget that I know where you come from. I can unmake you as fast as you tried to rise to power here. And with that, Dina straightened up, smoothed her peach silk gown, and glided to the doors, waiting for Rolf to rise and open them for her. Ariana wrung her hands in her lap as she stared at her soup. They were all looking at her. She could feel it. And though the queen's words had been whispered, there was no way anyone could have missed hearing them. Did she leave now before incurring the queen's wrath even more? A few months ago, 
the decision would have been easy. But now, the idea of leaving the girls tore at her heart. And if she was honest with herself, the thought of leaving Michael brought just as much pain. Still, surely the others would turn her out as soon as they knew her origins. Everyone had lost sons, brothers, fathers, and loved ones in the Maritime War. They would escort her out of the palace themselves, no doubt. Finally, someone clinked his or her spoon on a dish and began to slurp the chowder again. Whispers began to follow, though none of the whispers were directed to her, save that of the girls asking tearfully what their grandmother had meant. Come now, Bathia stood and gently took the girls by their shoulders. I think I may have some dry dates hidden somewhere in my wooden chest. Let us see if we can find and enjoy them before bed. Yes? Ariana threw her a look of thanks as the older woman ushered the girls away. With a start she realized that everyone else was still looking at her, too, but instead of the shock or even hatred she had expected to see on their faces, she saw only sympathy. I only wanted to help. She wanted to shout. I never tried to seduce him. Without speaking a word, Master Russo got up and left the room. The uncomfortable silence continued until he returned and walked up to Ariana. He was holding a single quill. The queen is worried about her son, he began. She's been concerned with little else than finding him the perfect match since before he was born. I think I speak for everyone here, though, when I say that we need you. And more importantly, he needs you. He held out the quill. I believe there's a stack of parchments sitting on his desk right now that needs you as well. A kind smile cracked his round face. Ariana began to reach for the quill, but paused when she remembered the queen's threat. Master Russo seemed to read her mind. If it is the matter of your origin that concerns you, he glanced around at the table and everyone else nodded, we have already discussed that amongst ourselves. Ariana felt the surprise show on her face. They had been discussing her? She should have known better. Of course they would. She was nothing but odd by human standards. And, he continued, we have decided it matters not. You have done nothing but good for us since arriving. Ariana studied his shiny, red face with a frown. Surely he wouldn't mean that if he really knew the truth. But a closer look at his suddenly firm expression convinced her that he was very close to the truth, as were the others. And they had decided that it didn't matter. With a grin, Ariana took the quill and headed to the prince's study. The door to Michael's study was closed when Ariana arrived. She paused as she lifted her hand to knock. Would he want to see her? Or would he be too embarrassed after his mother's outburst and accusations? Gathering her courage, she knocked on the thick wooden door. If Master Russo and the others believed in her, then she, too, refused to be intimidated. What? His answer was sharp. She knocked again, and a moment later the door jerked open. His expression was fierce until he saw who stood there. She tried to give him a half-smile, holding up the pen in a foolish gesture to show him what she had come for. His face softened and he held the door open wider. I'm sorry. I thought you were someone else. The red shade returned to his face as he jammed a wedge underneath the door to hold it wide open, then stomped back over to his desk and yanked up his quill. Thankful his anger wasn't directed at her, Ariana quickly gathered up the papers he had left on the corner of his large desk and went to her usual place in the red chair by the window. Leaning back into the shadow of the window's dark, heavy curtain, Ariana curled her legs up against her chest then took a deep breath before she began checking the figures for mistakes. She found it difficult to concentrate on the numbers at first. The queen's voice continued to haunt her thoughts and distract her from her work. Was Dina right? Had Ariana ever come to this study with designs other than fixing the prince's tired mistakes? She searched her memory. In the beginning, her intentions had only been to make the numbers right. 
As the days had gone on, however, Ariana did have to admit that her quiet evenings with Michael were her favorite part of the day. There was a comfortable silence between them that, for once, Ariana did not wish to fill with talk. There was something warm and familiar about their evenings together. But what was it that made her yearn for more? She couldn't put her finger on the cause until Michael shifted and put his head on the desk. Then it hit her. When she was with him, Michael simply allowed her to be. Not even Renata had been able to do that. There had always been something she'd been trying to fix, from Ariana's posture to her understanding of politics to her history. But Michael knew what even Renata had not. He knew of Ariana's humanity. And yet he kept her near anyway. I am sorry for my mother's outburst. Michael pushed his chair away from the desk and rubbed his eyes. Ariana watched him carefully. She couldn't deny that the event had shaken her, but she didn't want to hurt or further agonize him either. She couldn't imagine having such a mother. She is concerned that I marry a woman who can raise the status of our kingdom, he continued, eyes still closed. This made Ariana's heart falter just a little. But she refused to admit why. Her myopic goals have made her blind to anything else that might help the kingdom in any other way that she has not personally seen in her own mind. He finally turned and looked at Ariana, his hands behind his head. I'm glad to see that you're feeling better, by the way. Ariana gave him a dry smile. It is only a head cold, Bathia had pronounced the week before when Ariana's nose had stopped working and her throat had felt like razors were scraping its insides. Whatever a head cold was, it was possibly the most dreadful ailment Ariana had ever experienced, apart from the frill shark's bite. This had been the first night she and the girls had attended supper with everyone else. What a way to return. How about we do something different tomorrow, he asked. I know you like to take the girls to the garden after studying in the mornings. Would you be interested in learning about archery instead? Ariana had no idea what archery was, but Claire often went on about how she wanted to learn. Not that the event itself mattered. Spending time with Michael would be a joyful event. Eagerly, she nodded. Good, he leaned forward again and picked up his quill once more. I look forward to it. And how is the work progressing? Master Russo poked his head in through the open door and gave Ariana a sly smile. I thought I might come and ensure that your figures were getting done properly. Ariana blushed, and Michael tossed a wad of used parchment at the steward over his shoulder. Master Russo returned to the hall without another word, chuckling to himself all the way. Chapter 23 Do Ariana stared at the odd contraption in her hands. What was one supposed to do with a string tied to both ends of a bent stick and a bunch of long pointy sticks? She gingerly put her finger to touch the feathers near the end of one of the long pointy sticks. Then she poked the stick's sharp point, only to yank her hand back as a drop of blood beaded on it. Does this mean I get to go hunting with you? Claire bounced up and down as she trailed after Michael, who was carrying three more of the strange device. Michael chuckled. I'm not sure what you're going to hunt, as I've never seen anything larger than a dog running through Maricanta's streets. And I don't think Bathia would take too kindly to you hunting her greyhound. Now, he handed each of the girls their own contraption, since everyone has a bow, let's walk to the other side of the field. We don't want to be anywhere near the palace. Why? Lucy asked. Michael bent and slung the quiver, as he'd called it earlier, over his shoulder. Because if we miss, which you will on your first tries, we don't want anyone to be in the way. An arrow in the foot or arm would make an awful gift to one of our friends. He continued to warn the girls about the dangers of playing with the bows and arrows, as they were apparently called, as their little group traipsed across the field of sand and wild grasses. It was the first time Ariana had ever ventured on the east side of the palace grounds, and the walk was warm and sunny. 
Smiling to herself, she only half listened to his warnings as the wind played with her gown and threatened to pull loose locks down from her hair. What a perfect day! The sound of Michael's voice and the girl's laughter was soothing, and with the sun on her face and the sound of the ocean behind it, Ariana could really think of nowhere else she'd rather be at that moment. Of course, that thought alone made her feel a little guilty. But, she wondered hesitantly, wouldn't her mother want her to be happy? Wouldn't Renata want her to make the best of where she was here and now? She believed it to be so. Her father, of course, would see her position with the humans quite differently, and she shied away from thinking of his response too closely. Rinaldo would have been pleased, though. She was sure of it. When they reached the other end of the field, which was shaded by a line of squat, thick palm trees, Michael began to put together a standing rectangle with a set of circles painted inside of it, something he called the target. You want to hit the middle circle with your arrow, or get as close to it as you can. Ariana stared at the arrows on the ground before smiling to herself. This would be easier than she'd thought. Without waiting to hear the rest of his instructions, she picked up one of the arrows and walked over to the target. She turned to make sure they were watching her, then whacked the center of the target with the end of the arrow as hard as she could. When she turned back around to gloat over her cleverness, however, the girls were rolling in the grasses, laughing so hard that tears were streaming down their faces. Even Michael, who was attempting to keep a straight face, was turning red as he bit his lip. When she frowned at him in confusion, he began laughing as hard as the girls. Ariana looked back at the target as the others continued to laugh hysterically. She'd hit the target with the arrow, she thought as she glared at it. What else could they want of her? Still laughing, Michael walked up to Ariana and guided her back to the girls before taking the arrow from her hands. Ariana crossed her arms and glowered at him. What was so funny? She watched with resentment as he faced the pointy end of the arrow toward the target and fitted the bow string in a notch she'd not noticed in the back of the arrows earlier. Then he raised the bow and arrow, and to her surprise, began to stretch the string so hard that the bow began to bend. Farther, farther he drew the arrow back until his right elbow was as high as his ear. Then, in one swift movement, he let go of the arrow and it flew out of his hands before hitting a tree several yards behind the target. I thought you were supposed to aim for the target, uncle. Lucy pulled on his shirt. I was just showing you the proper stance, he mumbled as he fitted another arrow onto the string. Ariana saw what the girls did not, however, in the way his eyes tightened ever so slightly as he pulled the arrow back again. She put her hand over her mouth to hide her laugh while Michael missed the target again. All right, everyone, he said, still not looking at Ariana, you've seen the stance. Now you try. Still trying to stifle her silent giggles, Ariana did as she was told, and she and the girls began to let their arrows loose as well. And not one of them hit the mark. Her arrow didn't even leave the bow in the right direction, falling to the ground before she let go of the string. The girls fared little better. As she leaned over to grab another arrow, Ariana felt the slightest tug at her own bow. Whirling around, she gasped as Lucas held a finger up to his mouth for her to be quiet. As though she had any other choice. With a sly grin, he gently pulled the bow from her hands and lifted an arrow from the ground, right behind Michael, who was leaning over Lucy to help her adjust her stance. Then, in one fluid motion, Lucas had fixed the arrow in its proper place and let it fly, hitting the center of the target with a loud crack. Michael jumped, and Ariana nearly fell over laughing herself as he whipped his head around to see where it had come from. When his eyes rested on his brother, he scowled. I thought you were working at the docks today. And I thought you were teaching the girls archery. What does it look like I'm doing? Michael snapped. I'm not sure, but it's not archery. Michael continued to scowl at his brother, but Lucas sauntered over to Ariana and handed her back her bow before fetching her another arrow. Hold your hand up here, by your chin, he instructed her, taking her hand in his and lifting it up. 
not by your chest. Now, widen your feet, he gently kicked her worn boots with one of his own large feet. Ariana's chest fluttered a bit as Lucas leaned in close to adjust her grip on the bow. Though she had never considered Lucas in the same light she did Michael, it was still a bit shocking to have a man so close. Why hadn't Michael tried to teach her this way, she wondered. Then she shook her head bitterly. Because he wasn't interested in her that way. He was supposed to marry a rich princess who would replenish all of the Maricantan's wealth and win the hearts of the people. With a huff, she tried to focus her efforts on Lucas's instructions and not the way she suddenly resented his brother. Now, Lucas whispered, let go. To Ariana's amazement, the arrow zipped straight toward the target. And though it didn't come anywhere near the center, she did what Michael had not. She turned immediately to see Michael's reaction, but to her disappointment, he hadn't seen her hit the target. Instead, he was quietly conversing with a stranger in yellow clothing. A runner, she guessed. Boys and young men, Master Russo had once explained to her, were hired to take messages from one place to another. As they spoke in hushed tones, however, she noticed that all joviality and even his annoyance had fled from Michael's face. Lucas noticed this, too, and though he handed Claire another arrow and gently angled her elbow, he studied his brother with a slight frown. After dismissing the messenger, Michael stared down at the parchment he now held. Well? Lucas took a step toward him. Just, Michael swallowed, still staring at the parchment. His jaw tightened, and his eyes became daggers. Keep them safe and busy, he snapped. But Michael. Just do as I say. Michael shouted. Ariana and Lucas exchanged a stunned glance while Michael stomped off toward the palace. I'll be back, he barked over his shoulder. What's wrong with Uncle Michael? Lucy whimpered. He got a letter that he needs to respond to, and no one likes boring letters when you could be doing this. Lucas turned his attention back to the girls before Ariana could. But don't worry, he must their hair in turn, I'm better at archery anyways. You'll get a better lesson from me. The girls eventually returned to trying to hit the target, but Ariana couldn't bring herself to continue. Her thoughts were with the man stalking toward the palace. You're worrying about him. Ariana looked over to see that Lucas's eyes were trained on the palace, too, his brow furrowed. You shouldn't worry, though. Ariana frowned at him, but Lucas just shook his head. You can't let his poor archery skills or his gentle manners fool you, he said, giving her a hard smile. Because my brother could be very dangerous if he chose to be. Michael hadn't returned by the time the girls grew tired of the archery, nor did he appear for dinner or when she tucked Claire and Lucy into bed. Ariana's concern turned to a near panic, though, when he failed to appear in his study. Without anyone to distract her, Ariana finished the figures all too soon and for the lack of something better to do, decided to go to sleep. But sleep wouldn't come. After an hour of tossing and turning, Ariana finally gave up and decided to go for a walk. She pulled on her old boots and slipped out of the palace. She managed to somehow make it out of the palace without waking anyone, to her knowledge. The guard said nothing as she tiptoed by him and out onto the walkways that sprawled all through the gardens. It should have been a peaceful evening. Crickets chirped and the ocean lapped gently at the shore. The air had a thick, sticky feel to it. It should have been soothing to Ariana, considering it felt much like the water, but there was an undercurrent that made the hair on the nape of her neck stand on end. As she passed the edge of the palace and began down toward the field, a light in the window of the palace chapel caught her eye. Ariana stopped and squinted. Sure enough, someone had lit a candle inside. Removing her clunky boots, Ariana snuck up to one of the chapel's color-stained front windows and tried to peer inside. To her disappointment, it was empty. A sudden wave of frustration washed over her, and with it, a burst of anger as well. 
Without thinking about what she was doing, Ariana stomped into the chapel. What are you doing to me? She stared up at the altar. I know you can hear me. There was no audible or visible answer, but Ariana charged ahead anyway. Every time I have happiness within reach, you yank it away. Was that why you made me? Why I am the way I am? So that you could have a plaything when you're bored? A treacherous tear gathered at the corner of her eye, but she shook it away angrily. Ronaldo loved you, and you let him die. Renata took care of me, and you let her disappear. And now, Michael? What horrid fate do you have planned for him? Her breath caught in her throat as the truth rose up within her, a truth she had done her best to suppress for years. But not anymore. She was through with quieting the voices inside her. I loved you. This time, the tears ran freely down her face, and the flickering light of the candle grew blurry. And you turned your back on me. You, too? Ariana whirled around. Michael was kneeling behind the second bench. Had he somehow heard her silent words? I couldn't sleep either, he said, and Ariana's heart was both relieved and broken at the same time. Swallowing her disappointment, she turned to go, but he reached out and caught her arm. If it's impropriety you're concerned with, the holy man is in his study. He nodded at the corner of the room where the outline of a door was framed by the light of a fire on the other side. Do you mind my asking why I never see you here? Ariana studied him warily, but his expression wasn't condescending or judgmental. Just curious. I know you go to the beach on holy days, he said, letting go of her arm. I also know that your brother was a man of faith. He watched her for a moment longer. What happened to you, he whispered, to make you stop believing? Michael couldn't hear her through her silence, Ariana thought. But he wanted to, it seemed. She stared down at the red rugs beneath her bare feet. The only people who had ever tried so hard to hear her were her mother and Renata. And Ronaldo. Her heart clenched up as her brother's face flashed in her mind. I must confess, Michael said, looking back up at the stained glass mural behind the altar, it's easier to remain faithful on days when life is good. And life hasn't seemed good very often as of late. There are so many nights when I feel as though my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. He turned and met Ariana's gaze, his eyes glinting like gold in the weak light of the candle. But I know there is a purpose in all this. I wish I knew what it was, to be honest, but there is one. There must be. Ariana only watched, confused. Our debts are due tomorrow, he said in a voice nearly too quiet to hear. I've put it off as long as I could. And your work with treasury numbers has helped, for sure. But that missive I received this morning was from the King of Tumun. He'll be here in a week to collect his dues. Michael's neck flexed, and for a moment, fire burned in his eyes. Or at least, what is actually due him. Not a dust mote more. Ariana sat at the edge of his bench and hesitantly placed her hand on his arm. What wasn't he telling her? He studied his hands. Without the money we owe the Tumenians for our war debts, my mother and I will be replaced, and the King of Tumun will own our kingdom as well. Ariana sharply drew in a breath, and he only shook his head and gave her a sad smile. Just another full contract made by my beloved grandfather. We've sold most of the household goods, or as much as we could, at least, without attracting more attention than necessary. My brother has shrunk the navy so that it's as small as we can possibly function with. Most of the horses are gone. The staff is a fraction of what it was before the war. He shook his head and ran a hand through his dark, messy curls. Ariana had to resist a sudden and strong urge to run her hand through them, too. I've done all I know how, but there is no protocol for this. He surprised her then by taking her hand. 
she held her breath as he turned it over in his own. I want to thank you for all you've done for us. Ariana looked at the floor again, her cheeks coloring. All she had done was fix his tired mathematical mistakes. But he wasn't done. I suppose you are the reason we have lasted as long as we have. And I don't mean just now. If you hadn't saved me that day in the storm, my mother probably would have married the next dandy that came along. Don't ever repeat a word of this to my mother, but she probably would have picked some ignoramus with the sense of a walrus. In spite of such a somber topic, Ariana giggled. Finally a smile. But in all seriousness, he squeezed her hand, you were our gift from the Maker. Never doubt that. Then he stood. I suppose we should get some sleep tonight. I've got some bad news to break to the household tomorrow. Might as well be rested first. He held his hand out. Coming? Everything in Ariana wanted to take that outstretched hand, but she shook her head instead. Well, then, he said, I will tell the guards to keep an eye out for you. Ariana gave him the biggest smile she could muster as he turned and left. Looking back up at the altar, she tried to find words for all the maelstroms and quiet pools of peace that were mixing about inside her heart. I don't know if that's true, she finally told the Maker. I don't know if I can believe that you have a plan for it all. But if you really mean it. If you meant that as a sign of some sort, then let this work. Please let this work. For an idea was already forming. And it scared her to death. Chapter 24 a risky venture. Ariana put her shoes in their usual place behind the rocks and then went to stand at the edge of the water. The stars above her seemed particularly bright, despite the gray that was beginning to grow on the horizon, and she was overcome with a sudden desire to simply sit on the sand and stare up at them until dawn. Still, she knew deep down that really what she wanted to do was stall. With a sigh, she slung her borrowed bag over her shoulder and put one foot in the water, then the other, trying to ignore the warning voice in her head that wondered what would happen if she didn't change. The jellyfish that had recently taken to patrolling the section of the beach would be making his usual territorial rounds soon. If she didn't start swimming, she would never make it past the creature in time. She had seen enough of the jellyfish in her last two trips out to sea to recognize the black cloud within its clear blob of a body. The little monster, no larger than her fist, had been to the deeps. All right, I'm ready, she told the maker when her feet could hardly touch the ground. As though answering her, Ariana felt the prickle begin in her toes, and she dared to smile. The transformation was no longer as painful as it had once been. Whether she was simply becoming immune to the magic or not, she did not know. Just that she was grateful. As soon as her tale was complete, she headed for the Pearl Farms. They were farther away than her old tower was, so Ariana slowed to pace herself as she began to pass familiar landmarks. She purposefully ignored the broken city to her left. The last time she dared to look, the ocean had already reclaimed the mansion and the houses and the streets. It was almost as if her family had never been there at all. The sight of the pearl farms brightened her dark musings considerably. Usually, her people would have harvested them back when the air and water were still cool. But the oyster beds were ripe for harvest, as no merperson had attended them in a very long time. She should get a good haul if the pirates hadn't found them already. As a child, Ariana had begged her father on more than one occasion to let her work at the Pearl Farms. The framed boxes of the oyster beds were just higher than the water's surface. She could very easily work with the oysters, Ariana had argued passionately. Even during the day. But as always, her father had said no. The irony of her gathering the shells now was not lost on Ariana as she surveyed the dozens of raised oyster beds. The long rows of shells were just high enough to stick out of the water, which meant Ariana had to push her head and shoulders above the surface to gather them. Of course, being above the surface meant she could not see what was below the surface. 
As Ariana hurriedly shoved the oysters into her bag, she distracted herself from the danger by imagining what their arrival might change at the palace. Perhaps the oysters themselves would give Cook something new to work with that evening, a treat the crown wouldn't have to pay for. Perhaps the money would be enough to help pay back the Tamenian king. Perhaps they would make Michael smile. As soon as her bag was heavy, Ariana slung it over her shoulder and started back to the palace. The sky began to turn from gray to coral pink, buoying Ariana's spirits. Why hadn't she tried this sooner? A flash of blue floated to her right. Then it was gone. Ariana picked up her speed, but the bag was heavy and hard to pull, and her dress was getting in her tail's way. The blue flashed again, this time below her. Ariana bolted, but it wasn't fast enough. The jellyfish had found her. It shouldn't have been so fast. Jellyfish were slower than mere people, Ariana thought, as if thinking the truth could make the monster change its form back to what it had been. But the jellyfish was keeping up, just a few parsecs behind her. She swerved back and forth, hoping the change in direction would throw it off, but the jellyfish followed easily. Ariana was breathing hard as she passed the city and her tower. She swerved to the left and to the right, diving deep and racing to the surface. But nothing deterred the creature. Just as she began to tire, she noticed that the water was rapidly growing shallow. Change me! She begged the maker. Change me! Please! But no change came, and the jellyfish was almost to her. Ariana began to drag herself onto the beach on her elbows, curling her tail up out of the water as much as possible. Knowing exactly what kind of pain she was about to experience and most likely die from in seconds, she scrunched her eyes shut as she crawled out of the water. So this is how I'm going to die. But just as the sticky tentacles should have closed around her fins, two hands grabbed her firmly by the arms and yanked so hard that she flew out of the water and landed on a body. Whoever it was let out a oof. A moment passed before Ariana was able to force her eyes open. When she did, however, she realized that she was lying right on top of Michael. For a long time, they stared at one another in shock before Ariana had the courage to look back behind her. And just where she had been lying in the water, a gray blob floated up and down. It was watching her. Ariana shuddered at the thought. Her shudder seemed to pull her savior from his stupor. He sat up and immediately wrapped his arms around her and squeezed her against his chest, muttering prayers of thanks to the Maker. Still too stunned to even attempt to pray, Ariana huddled in his warm, strong embrace and continued to stare at the jellyfish. What were you doing? He finally groaned as he pulled back to examine her. Where there had been relief in his face only moments before, now he looked, well, livid. What in the blazes convinced you that this was a good day to die? Then he froze. Ariana's blue-green scales that stuck out from beneath her dress glinted in the direct sun of the morning. Out of water, they were nearly blinding. Immediately, she felt ashamed. As much as she might go about pretending to be a human woman, this was who she was. What she was. He had seen it once, of course, as a boy. But now he was a man, and men were, as Renata had assured her, very particular in their tastes. Merman preferred the usual dark-haired, pearl-white beauties that all the other mermaids would grow to be. And Michael? Well, Ariana was sure his boyhood dreams of marriage had never involved someone with a tail. As if in a daze, he reached out to touch, then pulled his hand back. I'm sorry, he whispered. I shouldn't have. It's just that, you're beautiful. She was dreaming. She had to be dreaming. And yet, his words hung in the air like smoke as he continued to stare at her tail in awe. Before he could go on with embarrassing either of them any more and saying things she knew he would later regret, she pulled the bag off her shoulder and handed it to him. Then she let herself fall onto the dry sand and soak up the reassuring rays of the sun, for each one reminded her that she was not dead. Ariana? 
The strange tenor of Michael's voice made Ariana open her eyes and prop herself up on her arms. Only then did she notice that her legs had finally returned. But that wasn't what he was staring at. You risked yourself for my kingdom? His voice was incredulous as he held the bag open. Of course she had. Ariana frowned at him, but he ignored her expression and drew her up into his arms again. Stop, Ariana wanted to plead. Stop before you say something we'll both regret. But she couldn't find it in her to pull away from his embrace. She could feel his heart beating through his soaked shirt. Had she ever felt another heart this close before? No, she realized. And now that she had, she didn't want it to stop. As if to make her heartache double, he kissed her hair once before whispering, No pearls are worth your life. You must never do anything like that again. But, thank you. Her hope wanted so desperately to flutter, to take off like the little butterflies she'd seen in the garden. But instead, she pressed it down, too afraid to let it rise. Chapter 25 While I Have You The ocean looked so peaceful from above. Ariana smiled to herself as she followed the girls along the shore. The afternoon was waning, dry and hot, and she had decided as soon as she'd set foot out the door that she would pay no heed to the monsters in the water. In fact, she would pretend they weren't there at all. As long as she and the girls stayed on dry ground, they could wander wherever they pleased. Today, that meant going to look at the tide pools north of the palace, or so the girls had informed her. Care for some company? Ariana turned back to see Michael following them. He was still in the same formal clothes he usually wore, but today his trousers were rolled up to just below his knees, and the sleeves of his shirt rolled up to his elbows. Had he planned to join them? The thought sent a wave of silly nerves through Ariana's stomach, and she tried to smother them. He was just looking after his nieces. Wasn't he? Still, Ariana felt a ridiculous grin spreading across her face as Michael caught up to her. So where are we off to today? he asked. Ariana drew a circle with her hands, then made her fingers wiggle inside the circle. The tide pools? Ariana nodded. He was getting better. Michael stretched his arms wide and twisted his torso a few times as they walked. Sounds perfect. I've spent all day cooped up in my study with no one but ugly men surrounding me, asking for pearls or money. I could use some pretty faces to distract me. Ariana tried to calm her racing heart. He was talking about his nieces. Three pretty faces, to be exact. Ariana gave up on trying to steady her heart and focused on keeping her eyes straight ahead but it was hard not to notice the way the powerful muscles in his lower legs flexed as he walked, making his gait smooth and confident. So different from Merman's tails, which were exactly the same as their female counterparts' tails, except longer. So what's so special about that necklace? Michael pointed at the conch shell Ariana had reached up to stroke. I don't know if I've ever seen you without it. Ariana paused, then removed the green fiber string from her neck. Taking his arm, she stood still and held the little conch up to his ear. Michael's eyes looked like they might pop who is that. He stared down at the little conch. I've never heard anything so beautiful. Ariana nodded and put the necklace back on with a sigh. What she wouldn't do for a voice to tell him. She thought about trying the new skill she'd been secretly practicing, but the wind was too loud. Then his face lit up. I forgot! He pulled a folded parchment, quill, and little ink bottle from his pocket. Claire! Lucy, he called, cupping a hand by his mouth. Let's stop and play here for a few minutes. But we want to see the tide pools. Lucy yelled back. We will. But I want to show something to Miss Ariana. You can play on the dunes. Just stay out of the water. 
Then, taking her by the hand, Michael led Ariana over to the shore near the water's edge. Ariana held her breath as they sat down. Holding his hand now somehow felt even better than it had that first time when he'd helped her out of the boat. His skin held the same delicious warmth as the sun, and his fingers were calloused and rough, as was the top of his palm. What kind of activity calloused just part of the hand? She didn't have long to wonder, for as soon as they were sitting he let go of her hand to open the parchment. Ariana wanted to groan as his fingers left hers, until he presented her with a completely blank piece of paper, as well as the ink bottle and quill. You've done so much for us, he said, holding her gaze, all laughter gone from his face. I wish. I wish I could repay you in earnest, but this is the best I can do, for now. Your pearls have afforded me a new stack of parchment. She looked down at the blank piece of paper in awe. And, he added, suddenly looking slightly sheepish, his eyes twinkling, I might also be a selfish creature. It would be very nice to hear you speak for an afternoon. It was a moment before Ariana could look away from his eyes long enough to focus on the paper. When she took up the quill, however, she found that her hand didn't want to stop. My aunt gave me this necklace when I was little, she wrote. I had trouble sleeping, so she told me to wear the charm around my neck. It is her voice that you hear, singing my lullaby. She infused enough of her power into the song so that it stays in the shell, and I can hear it whenever I want. It is all I have left of her since she disappeared. Michael took the paper. Upon reading it, his mouth turned down. I'm sorry, he murmured, then gave her a half-smile. I would give anything to hear my father's voice in something like that. He held his right hand up and pulled the ring off his finger. When he held it up, a gold band glinted in the dying sun. This was my father's. It's not even worth that much, but it was his, he swallowed. My father was the youngest prince of Ashland. He and each of his siblings received one of these rings from their father. He turned the ring over, revealing a single round blue stone embedded in the gold. I wanted to be like him. I've tried. But it's like I'm stuck in my grandfather's footprints, and my own feet won't move. Ariana wrote, You're not like your grandfather. Not one bit. Ariana pressed so hard into the parchment that it nearly tore. Michael placed his hand on her shoulder and squeezed, leaving Ariana momentarily short of breath once again. Thank you, he said, staring out at the waves. But he wore no smile this time. If there is one thing in this world that I refuse to be, it's my grandfather. What else did he do, she wrote. Well, aside from making deals with pirates, my grandfather was determined to fight a war that no one could win. Five years after it had begun, he took a ride on his horse one day. He left because he was annoyed that Master Russo told him that the Destinians were refusing to lend him more money. I only know this because he asked me to accompany him. I think that was the first day he realized what a hole he had dug us into. Our people had nothing to eat, our trade had vanished, and now those who had lent us money wanted it back. This troubled Ariana. She quickly scratched out, I thought King Everard was neutral. He was. He only sent money to help purchase food for the people. But when he found out that his aid to the mere people was also stolen by my grandfather, he cut off all funds. Michael sighed. Really, King Everard was the least of our worries. The Tuminians were the ones my grandfather really got involved with. The day after our ride, they sent word that they expected payment, and soon. My grandfather simply climbed into bed and swallowed an entire bottle of foxglove nectar. Michael shrugged and turned his hazel eyes on Ariana. I swore on that day that I would never let my heart leave my head. My grandfather chased pleasure and personal delight until it killed him. It was more comfortable to die of poison than to face the mess he'd created. Is that why you don't want to marry? 
Ariana regretted the words as soon as she'd written them, but she could tell from the change in his expression that he had already seen. Her face burned as she hurried to scratch them out, but Michael placed his hand firmly on hers, making it impossible to hold the quill. Then he tipped her chin up to look at her eyes. Believe me, it's not the wife I object to, he said softly. He dropped his hand and turned to look up at the Sun Palace, its blue windows gleaming in the setting Sunday my mother insists I marry a woman with a title. And saddling a woman and her kingdom with this shipwreck wouldn't be fair. Not until I've been able to make my kingdom worth something again. I would ask nothing of you, Ariana wanted to write, but she didn't. Instead, she kept her quill off the paper and instead wondered when she had truly fallen in love with the prince. All of her girlish fantasies were being lived out right now. Except she still had no voice, and the prince wasn't looking for a wife. But he was suddenly looking at her with the gentlest expression she'd ever seen. Of course, he gave her a crooked smile, from the way things are looking now, it will be years before that happens. He traced the bottom of her lip with his thumb, and his voice dropped to a whisper. Do you think any woman will still have me when I'm turning gray? While she was still lost in his eyes, a shriek sounded from farther up the shore. Michael was on his feet in an instant, with Ariana right behind him. The girls. Where were the girls? Every possibility of death and pain filled Ariana's imagination and threatened to drive her mad until they crested one of the sand dunes and found the girls alive and huddling together. Lucy! Claire! Michael half ran, half slid down the dune and grabbed both girls by an arm, turning them toward him. I told you to stay near. But Ariana didn't hear anything else that he said. She was too busy staring at the tide pool the girls had been looking into. Instead of the little circles of anemones, urchins, and sea stars that always inhabited the pools at low tide, the whole pool was filled with dying fish and other sea creatures. There was even a full-grown male seal. And every single one had been touched by the sortilage. Ariana turned back to Michael, who was still scolding the girls, and shook his shoulder. He glanced at the water once, then turned to stare at it with wide eyes. Ariana made a few frantic motions, but Michael just shook his head as he continued staring at the creatures. They all had black eyes and black veins that bulged out from their scales and skin. Nearly beside herself, Ariana whipped the parchment out and wrote on it so fast her writing was almost illegible. Did the girls touch? If they had, she had no idea as to what she would do. Did either of you touch anything? Michael gripped the girls' arms more tightly, but this time, his face was taut and his words desperate. Lucy and Claire just shook their heads, tears still falling down their faces. Michael drew them closer. You're absolutely sure? They nodded and began to sob. Michael pulled them into his chest and held them there as he looked up at the sky and thanked the Maker. Still clutching the girls, he finally turned to Oriana. What does it mean? he asked. My people have retreated to Gemiqua, where my grandfather lives. Without our protectors to guard the deeps, the creatures must be moving in and out unhindered. That's why your fishermen are stuck fishing in the bay. Only now I fear it's getting worse. How do we stop it? We don't, she wrote sadly. Not without my people. The words weighed heavy on Ariana's heart as they left the deathly tide pool behind and began the walk back to the palace. As they did, Ariana racked her memory for some way, any way to contact her family. Surely someone would come eventually. Then they wouldn't be able to ignore her cry for help. Her grandfather couldn't be so hard-hearted as to refuse peace with the new prince. Not when he saw what a different King Michael would be. To her surprise, Ariana found that her excitement was beginning to build even as Michael accompanied the girls back to their room. Perhaps she couldn't sing. But she could write. I'm afraid Lucas and I will be leaving tomorrow for a few days. We have some business with the Tamenians that I'm anxious to see finished, Michael said, 
pulling her aside in the hall after the girls were in their room. But don't worry. I'll be back soon. And after that, he surprised her by grabbing her hand and spinning her in a circle, we're going to celebrate what you've done for this kingdom. He let go of her hand and bowed. With a dance. Ariana clapped her hands. After such a day, she should have been devastated that he was leaving her with Dina. But having seen the tide pools, she knew she couldn't leave the ocean unattended any longer. She might look like a human, but deep down, she was still a mermaid, and guarding the ocean was her duty. And now Ariana had an idea, and a few days alone was just enough time to perfect it. Chapter 26 Stirrings If I may have your attention. Michael stood and held his goblet in the air. Everyone around the table hushed, even Lucas. Michael wore an outfit Ariana had never seen before, a uniform identical to Lucas's, with the exception of the gold braid trim winding around the black buttons, as opposed to Lucas's silver trim. The coats were the same shade of green as the ocean on a stormy day, so dark it was nearly blue. The color brought out the green in Michael's hazel eyes, and though Ariana had seen the uniform on Lucas several times and had found it quite fetching, there was something about seeing it on Michael that made her breath leave her. But then again, she wondered, could it be the light in his eyes that was so alluring? Or that he had cut his hair closer, like many of Lucas's military men? Or perhaps the way he was smiling? Tonight should have been a night of mourning, Michael said, breaking her trance. A week ago, I was contacted by the King of Tumun, who informed me that under no circumstances was he going to allow any further delay of the payment of our debts. If all had gone as it should have, I would not be wearing this uniform tonight. With that, he fixed his eyes on Ariana. Was it possible for a mermaid to melt? Because Ariana was sure she just might. When our newest family member found out about our predicament, however, she did something that, had I known about it, I certainly would have forbidden her from attempting. Ariana glanced around at the faces surrounding her, her cheeks suddenly burning. Many of you have asked me where the bag of pearls came from. I'm telling you now that Ariana took it upon herself to venture out into the ocean, Michael continued. A few people gasped, and even Queen Dina's jaw dropped. She turned to peer at Ariana, who dropped her eyes to the floor, not entirely convinced the queen wouldn't burst of indignation. She nearly died bringing us these. Michael held up a sack, slightly smaller than the one Ariana had filled. Setting it on the table where it landed with a gentle clunk, he allowed several pearls to roll out. The others gasped again, and Cook held up his spectacles to examine the cherry-sized pearls. Ariana smiled a little in spite of herself. With no one to faithfully tend the pearl farms in five years, the oysters had grown far larger than they were ever allowed under proper circumstances. Due to the mere people withdrawal, the pearls fetched a price more than ten times their usual worth. I was able to pay back the Tamenian king with less than a third of the pearls, including the interest he suddenly decided to charge us. We will be hearing no more from them. Ariana nearly missed it, the flex of his jaw and the way his eyes tightened just slightly, despite the smile on his face. But then his eyes returned to her. So I give this toast in honor of you, Ariana, he said in a voice that was suddenly tender, holding his goblet in her direction. Our kingdom will never be able to repay you for your bravery or your goodness. But we hope that somehow, his voice dropped even lower, we can find a way to make you happy. Their little party burst into applause and shouts as their goblets clinked. Then the room exploded into loud, cheerful conversation as Ariana tried to shake the blush and the ridiculous grin from her face as Michael left his seat and walked over to her. Do you like the dress? Ariana had to laugh. His expression was much like that of a hopeful puppy. She nodded quickly and put her goblet down to stand and spin a few times before him. No matter how many times she spun, she couldn't get over how the many layers of pink flared out when she moved. 
The gown itself looked a bit like a flower, with petals that draped delicately down her waist and off her hips. A thin layer of the gauzy material was draped all the way around the top of the gown, revealing just the tops of her shoulders and her collarbones. She looked back up from the exquisite gown to see Michael studying the dress as well, though his gaze took a bit longer to reach her eyes again. I was informed by the merchant that this is the latest style in Ashland, and that Queen Isabel from Destin has one just like it, with jewels sewn into the back instead of buttons. He shook his head and took another sip of wine. Not that I have any idea as to what that means, but, he cleared his throat twice, you certainly look fine in it. I mean, it looks fine on you. Or rather. I think you had better eat a little and thin that wine out, son. Queen Dina swept up to Michael's shoulder and gave him an indulgent look. I would like to have a word with our Ariana here myself. Ariana felt her stomach drop, and Michael fixed his mother with a suspicious frown, but Dina just shook her head. I swear I only mean to apologize. Ariana was convinced that Dina was the one who'd imbibed too much wine. And by the expression on Michael's face, he seemed to be thinking the same thing. Still, when his mother gave him another contrite nod, he glanced at Ariana. Reluctantly, she nodded as well. There was little Dina could do to her in this public setting, so close to her sons. Ariana hoped. Truly, Dina said as Michael walked away, I know that I have been less than fair to you since you arrived. But you must understand, the queen continued in a sudden rush, after my husband, father, and daughter died before and during the war, I couldn't bear to look at you. You also have two granddaughters who aren't mermaids, and they get about as much of your attention as I do, Ariana thought, but she let the woman continue. I know it will not make up for the way I've treated you, but, she finally met Ariana's gaze, her brown eyes glittering strangely in the light of the summer sunset as it filtered through the glass walls, I hope that perhaps we may start again. Dina was drunk. She had to be to make an apology like that. And yet, Ariana found herself smiling shyly and curtsying to the older woman. Did she really mean it? Ariana found herself greatly wishing she did. Supper continued in a more lively tone. As the meal went on, few actually stayed seated, but began to mingle, carrying their dishes with them. Jokes were cracked, stories of Michael and Lucas as boys were shared, and the food was more plentiful and varied than any Ariana had tasted since coming to the palace. Instead of the thin chowder and bland bread she had grown accustomed to, there were bowls of fresh fruit, brown sugar bread, dried papaya strips, two kinds of cheese, sardines, thin crackers, and date cakes, which made the girls squeal. Ariana had just heaped a thick spread of cheese atop a sardine and cracker when she found Lucas suddenly at her side. Sardines, huh? He took a swig from his goblet and eyed her with a wicked gleam in his eye. Isn't that kind of dark? I mean, aren't you half? Ariana elbowed him and glanced around to see that no one had heard. He only laughed though, almost giddy like a boy as he leaned closer. Don't worry about that. Everyone knows. I mean, not everyone knows, but everyone has their suspicions. And you know what? No one cares. Ariana stared at him, not sure whether or not she should set him straight that her people were in fact, not related to fish in the least bit, or whether she should be shocked that the others were so close to the truth. Of course, Master Russo had hinted before that they knew she wasn't native to them. But, was it possible that they could know her true origins and still love her? In all seriousness though, Lucas's face was suddenly somber, I truly cannot thank you enough for what you did for my brother and for all of us. Ariana felt the blush rise to her cheeks again and shrugged as she studied her goblet. I mean it, Lucas continued, his brow furrowing. It wasn't just the kingdom that you saved. Michael was going to die. Ariana froze, but Lucas continued. Much to my shame, the old sailor, the one that assaulted you, wasn't silent after all. It seems that a tradesman from the south heard him going on about a mermaid before we were able to get him into the dungeon. 
The tradesman then took the old man's word to the Tamenian king, who immediately demanded that you be included in the kingdom's payment as well. Ariana stared at him in horror, unable to move. Fool that my brother is, he agreed to hand his throne over to fulfill our grandfather's agreement. But he had fully resolved to fight the king to the death before he handed you over. He was furious. You were never part of the agreement. But the king insisted on having the mermaid. Ariana looked down at her legs, incredulous. But I'm not a mermaid anymore, she wanted to protest. Lucas dropped his voice further and leaned over to whisper in Ariana's ear. You have no idea what a mermaid is worth in this world we live in. Even one who seems to be dormant. Just the whisper of one will send kings scrambling to their treasuries. He leaned back, but his face did not lose its solemnity. The war took my father, my sister, and her husband. I know I complain about him and like to poke fun, but we can't lose Michael. I can't lose him. So, thank you. In that moment, Ariana finally saw Lucas for who he really was. Past the square jaw covered in stubble, the brawny arms and ever flirtatious smile, there was a young boy who adored his big brother. Her chest constricted as she gave him a sad smile. She knew exactly how that felt. Even more importantly, however, she had glimpsed a glorious, weighty truth. Before she had planned to risk her life bringing him the pearls, Michael had already chosen to risk his life for her. Stop hogging the girl and go find your own. Without waiting for Lucas to even look up, Michael shoved his brother out of the way and grabbed Ariana by the waist. It may not be a proper ball, but the least I can do is ask you to dance. He leaned in to breathe in her ear, you're too pretty not to be dancing tonight. Ariana's arms and legs suddenly felt like they were made of jellyfish. But she grinned and nodded and let him lead her out to the same balcony where she had watched him dance with the beautiful girl so many years before. Master Russo, he called over her shoulder, would you do us the honor? Ariana looked back to see Master Russo lift a strange object to his lips and take a deep breath. The music it produced was shrill and strange, but not at all unpleasant. Michael took her hand in one of his own and wrapped his other arm firmly around her waist. Slowly, he began to turn them in circles, whispering what she should do with her feet as they moved in time to the music. And though she wasn't at all as graceful as the young girl at the ball had been, Ariana couldn't remember a time when she had ever been so happy. Even in the ocean. It wasn't long before the others were dancing, too. Bethia and Rolf, Mario and Noemi, and Lucas and Lucy twirled around them. Laughter rang in the air, and even Queen Dina smiled once before heading back inside the palace. After a few quick, light-hearted songs, Master Russo switched to one that was slow and melancholy. Cook's daughter, Nan, joined in, plucking some kind of stringed instrument in harmony. The song was one of mourning, and it touched Ariana in a way no mare song had ever moved her before. Its melody sang of longing, reaching out to touch something that was just an arm's length away. And in that moment, something in the air shifted. The spinning couples that surrounded them began to fade as Michael drew her closer. Ariana trembled as he stared down into her face. And the light in his eyes confirmed what she had wondered before. Somehow, he had seen inside her soul. Tell him, an annoying voice in her head whispered. You have a plan to reunite your peoples. Who knows when you'll have him to yourself again? Ariana opened her mouth, but as she did, his right hand slipped out of hers and his fingers reached up to trace the edge of her jaw. Slowly, slowly he cupped her face, his fingers making her skin tingle wherever they touched. Leaning down, he drew her face toward his own. Ariana closed her eyes, her lips trembling as she tried to slow her breath. Her blood raced, and a hunger she'd only felt hints of before awakened somewhere deep inside her. Renata had been wrong. Ariana was worthy of being chosen. He was choosing her now. Michael. 
The moment was broken, as if someone had thrown a bucket of cold water on it. Ariana and Michael looked up to see Queen Dina holding a parchment marked with a purple seal. She waved it a little, ignoring Ariana's look of annoyance. I need to speak with you. Now. Michael let out a gusty breath and met Ariana's eyes with a pained expression. Coming, mother. Chapter 27 Duties Call Is this really that urgent? Michael asked as soon as they were back in the dining hall away from the merriment. Ariana may have done more for our kingdom than any of us could have imagined, Dina said coolly, holding up the folded parchment again. Surely you wouldn't have her go out to sea again. Of course not. It is her prior sacrifice that has already done its work. It seems we are to be visited by a princess from a distant island kingdom. She held out the parchment. This was just delivered to me by a runner. Princess, she opened up the parchment and skimmed it. Ines. Princess Ines of Espigma's Isle. The princess believes that our kingdoms have mutual interests. We might, she says, both benefit from some sort of agreement. Michael stared at his mother for a long moment until the words sank in. What kind of agreement is she interested in? He growled. It must be an interesting one, considering that until now none of us has ever heard that such a place even exists. She says that her kingdom rarely trades openly with others because they have always feared that someone might see them as a potential conquest. They mine gold, their ships bring in whalebone, and when the mare people were doing their duty, they traded pearls as well. But since the pearl shortage has kept everyone lacking, they took an immediate interest when we came up with the means to produce them. It was a one-time replenishment, mother. I'm not sending Ariana back down. She nearly died. I'm not asking you to send her again. Dina took both his arms in hers and looked up at him, her eyes sparkling. I only wish that you would convince this Princess Ines to truly consider us. If they are as wealthy as this parchment suggests, then our problems could be solved. You could take the crown, and we could be free of these poverties forever. Michael crossed his arms and frowned down at his mother. And you believe all of this based on a single letter without a dust mode of proof that she's telling the truth? That there even is a Princess Ines? He scoffed. She sounds more like a myth to me. Myth or not, she'll be here in three days hence and I expect you to put on a good show. She paused and straightened his coat. I know, she lowered her voice, that you find Ariana pretty. And she is a very pretty girl. But you need to think of the kingdom and of your duty. She stopped. I also know I've always been a bit, flighty, but you have always been my rock, as your father was before you. And the kingdom needs you to do your duty now more than ever. A union with a wealthy land could prevent us from falling into greater debt and help restore our people's livelihoods. Michael could only glare at his mother and choke back the roar that wanted to escape his throat. Why now? Just when his life was taking a new turn, one he had, in all honesty, not dreamed possible, this fell into his life. I know you're upset, Dina said. Upset is an understatement. When have I ever shirked my duties? His voice grew louder. When have I complained about taking on yours? Never. And that is why I ask this of you now. She sighed. I know what you're thinking. And our kingdom will be forever indebted to her. She is even technically of the right class for you. But what more can Ariana really bring us? A good heart, one that sacrifices when others need it. Love and attention for the granddaughters you choose to neglect on a daily basis. He rubbed his eyes. She has been better to me than I ever deserved. To us. Particularly after all the ways you've chosen to extend your benevolence. Yes, she is good. And there are a thousand more good-hearted girls like her. But where is her family, Michael? They abandoned her, left her for dead. How likely are they to send a dowry of any price? What we need is money and trade. And Princess Ines has both. 
Chapter 28 Whispers Ariana had tried to fight the feelings of disappointment when Michael didn't return to the party. She had something she wanted desperately to show him, and the impromptu celebration had seemed the perfect time. He didn't come to breakfast the next morning, either, until it was nearly time for Master Russo to chase him down with all sorts of business for the day. Ariana tried to catch his eye, but no matter how much she smiled at him, she couldn't get him to glance at her. The day got only stranger. Queen Dina was having Noemi take old tapestries and decorations out of storage as Ariana and the girls gathered their things to go outside. It's not ideal, the queen clucked to herself, her silk-covered arms crossed as she frowned up at the faded red tapestries. Still, it's preferable to looking completely destitute. Ariana's time with the girls and their studies crawled that morning, and when the midday meal finally did arrive, Michael didn't appear at all. By supper time, Ariana's stomach was in knots. She'd been sure at first, but he was just busy. There were plenty more debts to settle aside from two months, although that had been the greatest. No doubt he wanted to get his kingdom independent as quickly as possible. But when he spoke only to those on the left side of the table that night, Ariana decided she would have to take the matter into her own hands. Excusing herself early, Ariana stood just around the corner to his study. He never retired for the day without setting his study to rights, refilling his ink jar and organizing his parchments for the next morning. He'd wanted to say something the night before. She was sure of it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have touched her so tenderly. Ariana could still feel the warmth of his hand on her jaw and the way he had held her face as he leaned down toward her. But, a mean voice whispered, might he be regretting it? Before she could answer the mean voice, steps sounded down the hall. Ariana froze as they passed, only to realize it had been Bathia. Another set followed soon after, however, and the quick, steady pace made Ariana's heart jump into her throat. But instead of turning the corner where she could intercept him, the steps slowed and then stopped. And then continued even faster without turning. Ariana kicked the wall, which only made her toe hurt, before running after him. He might have decided he wasn't going to see her anymore, but he was going to tell her to her face if that were the case. She caught up with him just as he stepped out into the garden. Not waiting for him to turn, she grabbed his arm and made him face her. As soon as he turned, nearly all of her confidence fled her. The eyes that had been a warm gold with hints of summer green and sky blue the day before were hard now, as he leaned back slightly. Ariana. His voice was polite. You've helped so much that I thought I would give you an evening to yourself. You're lying. For a moment, Michael looked as though he might fall over. Those truly hadn't been the words Ariana had planned to speak as her first, but it was too late to take them back now. You. You spoke. Just whispers. I've been practicing. And I'm not very fast yet. Indeed, speaking was almost painfully slow. Why didn't you speak sooner? All the distance was gone from his voice and body now, but for some reason, that annoyed Ariana even more. It's rather hard to whisper underwater. She frowned at him. And I had to practice first. I'm not used to how the air feels in my mouth. For a moment, the warmth returned to his eyes, and Ariana's heart rose. He shook his head slowly, his mouth still open. And you've been practicing all this time? Since I stubbed my toe and let out a groan by accident. Well, a whispered groan. Without seeming to be aware of it, Michael stepped so close she could feel the heat radiating from his arm. Standing so close he could have kissed her had he wished to, he opened his mouth, but Ariana wasn't done. Now that she could speak, she fully intended to do so. Why did you leave last night? And why have you been avoiding me? I thought, she swallowed, but suddenly couldn't finish. He blinked rapidly a few times before looking down and reaching into his pocket. 
He then pulled out a folded parchment with a purple seal, the same one Dina had held the night before. Instead of opening it, however, he only turned it over in his hands a few times. I've dedicated my whole life to this kingdom, he finally said, nearly whispering himself. But I never thought she would ask me to do this. Ariana held out her hand, and to her surprise, he handed the parchment over without protest. As soon as she began to read, she felt her blood go cold. You're going to marry her, she whispered when she got to the end. I haven't agreed to it. But it's what your mother wants. She nodded as she handed it back. He took her by the shoulders. But it's not what I want. Then what do you want? He said nothing for a moment, rubbing her arms with his thumbs, though their speed made the touch feel more like nerves than affection. I want a friend, he said. I want a companion who will counsel me and help me see what is right. I want a family and peace. He looked up at the stars. What I wouldn't give for peace for my people and my house and me. Want me. She felt like shouting, but fear tied her tongue firmly to the roof of her mouth. What will you do? She finally asked with some difficulty. I don't know. What if, why was talking so hard? What if the maker gave you certain wants to show you what you need? She couldn't believe she was saying those words. But after the last few days, she wasn't sure what she believed or didn't believe anymore. But how would I know which are mine and which are his? He crossed his arms over his chest. My grandfather seemed to think they were always one and the same. You said there had to be a purpose. She paused. Could it hurt to ask the maker before choosing? To take a little time to think about it? He stared at her for a long time, so long that her legs grew sore from standing still in one place. No, he said. I don't suppose it would hurt to ask. He started to turn, but she grabbed his sleeve. One more thing. The letter says this woman is from a far-off island? Ariana took a breath, hoping desperately that she didn't sound like a pathetic beggar. Yes. Where is it? Michael frowned and unfolded the letter to read it. He grimaced even harder when he finished. I'm not sure, to be honest. My mother says it was delivered by a man who claimed it had come from over the Third Sea. Michael, you must be careful. She pulled him closer without thinking. That means she's crossing over the deeps. Her throat hurt from straining to shout the whisper. And that's a bad thing? There's a reason my grandfather doesn't allow humans over the deeps. May I ask what the two of you are doing out here alone? Whispering in the night when you're not even to be betrothed is highly improper. Dina's harsh voice pierced the air. She went to stand by her son's side and took his arm. Only then did she make a face at Ariana. Wait, you can talk now? She glared up at her son. That seems convenient. Ariana shook her head. She didn't have the patience for the queen, so she continued addressing Michael. Have you heard of Sorthledge? Before Michael could answer, Dina rolled her eyes. A remnant of the Maker's enemy, she rattled off, that is buried deep in the earth. King Everard and Queen Isabel of Destin help expel it from other kingdoms from time to time. What of it? Destin's monarchs drive it out in small quantities, yes, Ariana said. But not like that in the deeps. In the deeps, it bubbles up from holes in the seafloor. She took a breath. Whispering was so much more taxing than she'd expected. At the bottom of underwater chasms, it tries to defy the maker in black clouds of poison. Those who are touched by the blackness are changed. She shivered at the memories. And you've seen such to prove it? Dina raised one perfect eyebrow and crossed her arms. Ariana nodded. A mermaid lost her dolphin when I was eight years. 
she went into the deeps to look for it. She spent only a few minutes inside the deeps, but within three days, she'd grown brown scales all over her body. Even her face was scaled, and sea foam stuck to her eyes. Ariana gulped some air. She would really need to practice this more. She writhed and screeched for days, trying to scratch her family and the healers. She even broke some furniture with her voice. She continued until the darkness was too much for her body. Dina turned to her son. And you expect me to believe. Just listen for once. Ariana, please continue. If this woman is traveling from the Third Sea without a Mergard escort of the Sea Crown himself or someone who has been directly blessed by him, then she has, or is being driven by, a power much greater than that which the Mer people possess. And it bothers you that the Mer people might not be the strongest in the Sea. Dina smirked as she smoothed her silk gloves. All the more reason to unite with them. Perhaps they'll rid us of the infestation in our waters. She raised an eyebrow at Ariana, her eyes challenging. Ariana ignored the jab and turned to Michael. This is dangerous, she whispered urgently to Michael. Either this woman is dabbling in something dark, or she's taking a gamble with the lives on everyone on her ship. Crickets chirped, and a few night birds called out their songs. Dina continued to fiddle with her gloves, and Michael stared out at the sea. Ariana just wished. Well, what did she wish? That he had listened to her? Well, he had. That he would leave this ridiculous notion of a strange foreign princess behind? Yes, she did wish that, fervently. But that didn't seem enough to fix the crack she could feel in her heart. Thank you, Ariana, he said in a quiet voice. I will consider all you have told me. In the meantime, Dina sniffed, I will escort you to bed. Someone around here should be concerned for propriety's sake. Suddenly too tired to argue, Ariana let the queen lead her away. As soon as they stood outside her bedroom, however, the queen grabbed Ariana's arm and gave it a yank. Listen to me now, mermaid. Yes, you might have saved us a few pennies. You even found a convenient way to pay off some of our debts, though I assuredly question your means, as you didn't seem to find it necessary until the King of Tumun threatened you directly. I didn't even know. Shut up. I need you to know now that you will never have my son. I did think for a short moment that you had given up on your schemes, or that, perhaps, you really did mean well for my family. But the way he looked at you last night and the way you tried to seduce him this evening told me everything I need to know. But I never. I said shut up. She shoved Ariana into the wall and held her there with a firm hand, her grip surprisingly strong for never someone who never lifted a finger around the palace. This princess is coming in two days. I fully expect you to either be gone or to stay invisible while she is here. Is that understood? Ariana glared at her. I said, is that understood? Dina's shout echoed down the halls as Ariana continued to hold her gaze. When Ariana still didn't answer, Dina pressed her foot into Ariana's toes, and Ariana gasped as pain shot through her foot. Dina then jerked her from the wall to the door, banging Ariana's head against the doorframe in the process. Throwing open the door, she tossed Ariana onto the ground. Then the door slammed shut, and Ariana heard the distinct click of a lock and key. Chapter 29 The Kindest of Intrusions Ariana was locked in her room for the rest of that night and into the next day as well. Somewhere deep inside, she hoped Michael might come looking for her. But he never did. This would have made Ariana angry, had it not been for the girl's absence as well. On other days when she had overslept, Claire and Lucy were banging on her door, singing at the tops of their lungs that morning was here and the last one up was a sea urchin. Only Dina came twice, to bring her water and a few slices of bread, refusing to even speak to Ariana both times. How long, exactly, 
did the queen plan to keep her locked up? On the second day of her imprisonment, the sun had been up for over an hour by the time there was a soft knock at her door. Then the lock clicked, and Ariana was relieved to see Bathia standing there with a tray of biscuits and jam. I am sorry it took me so long, Bathia said as she darted in to put the tray on Ariana's table. I do not think the queen wanted me here at all, but I knew better than to believe her. She nodded once and placed her hands on her wide hips. Ariana threw her arms around the woman. Thank you, she whispered. What is this now? Bathia held her back and studied her with a sly smile. You are full of surprises, Miss Ariana. What did she say about me? Ariana whispered. She was almost afraid to know. She announced at breakfast yesterday that you would be running an errand to a contact of hers in the city. Bathia shook her head as she scurried around the room, taking the chamber pot and replacing it with a clean one she'd carried in along with the tray. She said you would not be back for several days, possibly even a week or more. Bathia stopped moving for a moment and studied Ariana. My child, I hope you do not take offense, but I come from a people far different than these. My country is mostly made of sand and sun, but I was born in a little village off the coast of Hadjit. She tilted her head to the side. We had some of your kind who would trade with us from time to time. My kind? Ariana stuttered. Mistress Bathia, I am, but as she locked eyes with the older woman, Ariana could not utter the lie. Instead, she hung her head. Am I that transparent? No, child. The others suspect but I know only because my father was a merchant. I met others of your kind many times at night when he traded with them. But no more interruptions. She put the chamber pot down and took Ariana's hands. I heard what Prince Michael was telling Master Russo about this mysterious princess. He told Master Russo of your warnings. She leaned in. Child, I can tell you are not close to the Maker but he has given you these understandings for a reason. If there was ever one thing I learned from my mermaid friends, a dark look passed over her eyes, it is never to underestimate their premonitions. Your people were put here to guard the humans from the deeps. And if any human deserves to be guarded, it is Michael. But what can I do? Ariana whimpered. I'm locked in my room, Anne. Will a lock and key really keep you put? The corner of Bathia's lips twitched up. From what I saw for years and years, not even the Sea Crown's ambassador could keep his daughter in one place for very long. Ariana gawked at her. Not only had the old sailor seen her, but Bathia had seen her as well. One more soul who thought she was worthy of being looked upon. Ariana pulled Bathia into another tight hug choking back tears. Bathia clutched her tightly. Promise me, child, that you will save him from her. Whoever this woman is, her wiles will be poisonous. I can feel it! Finally, Bathia pulled out of their embrace and left with the chamber pot, apologizing as she relocked the door. Ariana understood, however, that it would be disastrous for all of them if Dina discovered her unfettered. So instead of trying to escape, Ariana sat on her bed and stared out at the ocean waves as they pounded the shore in their rhythmic song. She knew what she needed to do. But, as always, she was one step behind. Asterisk 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 Ariana hid her tray under her bed so that when Dina finally came with her bread, Ariana could pretend to be as cowed as ever. But aside from Dina's angry silence, Ariana's day was full of nothing but musings and annoyance. Until the girls arrived. Ariana. Claire called through the keyhole. We've come to rescue you. Yes. Lucy added with a giggle. Grandmother thinks she fooled us, but we fooled her. Lucy, move out of the way. We can tell her when we're inside and safe from Grandmother. After several failed attempts, the lock opened and the two girls spilled into Ariana's room. 
Look what we snuck from grandmother's evening dress. Claire's eyes sparkled as she held up a tarnished key. Now we just have to make you beautiful again. Where's your new dress? Put it on, quick! Why? Ariana whispered. The girls stopped and stared. Well, Lucy finally piped, isn't that something? Then, without losing another moment, Lucy began to pull contraband from the little bag they brought, while Claire pulled Ariana's pink dress from the stool where Ariana had folded it nicely. The strange princess is arriving in less than an hour. I heard grandmother say so. We knew she lied about you being gone, but it took us all day to get the key. Claire paused as she placed several jewel pins in Ariana's hair, a smug little smile on her face. And to borrow a few things. You have to be beautiful so he doesn't marry her. Lucy climbed into Ariana's lap. We don't want Uncle Michael to marry her. We want him to marry you. And how do you know so much? Ariana laughed. Each girl fixed her with a condescending stare. Really, Claire finally said with a huff, you should know us better by now. We know everything. Ariana believed that now. There. Claire held up a little hand mirror. What do you think? Ariana turned her head from side to side. Pink jewels sparkled all over her hair. Matching jewels shaped like teardrops dangled from her ears by silver chains. Your masters, she whispered to the girls, who beamed. Then Claire's eyes grew wide. You need to be there when she arrives. She pushed Ariana from behind. Go! Resolve hardened within Ariana with each step she took toward the palace entrance. They always met guests of lesser importance in the dining hall, where Michael could greet them at the impressive hall doors. But those of great importance were met on the Mother of Pearl Palace steps, flanked by the glass columns that had seashells and other ocean treasures suspended within them. Bethia was right, Ariana mused as she half ran to the palace entrance. Something was not right about this woman. She was too perfect. Her timing was too perfect. Ariana slowed only when she came to the last corner, throwing up a rare prayer of thanks to the maker for the new pink slippers Michael had given her with the dress. At least her boots wouldn't clunk tonight. She waited around the corner until the sun had nearly set and supper normally would have grown cold. Michael and Lucas stood conferring quietly together, both in their military attire once more. Queen Dina was caught up between fussing over the old decorations they had put up and whining about how late the princess was. But finally, just as dusk was falling, lights began to come into view from the path that wound up from the city. Ariana smoothed her dress and stepped out into the light of the torches. Ariana! Michael said as he, Lucas, and Dina turned. Dina's eyes narrowed as she surveyed Ariana's attire, but Lucas dashed forward and escorted Ariana out to their party. Michael took her hand for a moment before giving a formal bow and kissing her fingers. You look lovely, he said. What took you so long? Lucas asked. My apologies, she whispered, curtsying and turning to look pointedly at Dina. I was a bit detained on my errand. Lucas's eyes popped. Did you just speak? But how? I'm a quick learner, Ariana said, not breaking her gaze with Dina. Dina held her eyes for a moment longer before turning stiffly back to the path, which was now filled visibly with a dozen soldiers carrying torches on the ends of their staffs. Michael straightened as the entourage reached the foot of the steps. His jaw was clenched, but his face was a perfect mask of formal politeness and kingly reserve. All signs of stress disappeared from his face, however, as soon as their guest emerged from the shadows. Between the two lines of soldiers walked a woman with a figure so perfect Ariana had to look twice to believe it. Her eyes sparkled in the flames of the candles that lit the steps, and her blood-red lips curved into an exquisite smile as she took in the two gentlemen, whose mouths had literally fallen open. 
she melted into the lowest, most balanced curtsy Ariana had ever seen. Not even Master Russo, Ariana's unofficial manners instructor, could dip that far down. What a warm welcome! I had hardly expected the queen and the princes to greet me themselves. Please, allow me to introduce myself. I am Princess Ines. Ariana almost groaned. The woman's voice was painfully melodic. Listening to her speak was like listening to the nursery nurturers sing the little mare babies to sleep at night. And as if to pour salt on the wound, as Princess Ines moved up the steps into the light, her ebony hair flowed down her back and past her knees in ripples of shiny, loose curls. Her skin was without freckle or flaw. It was a long second before either of the brothers could stop gaping like fish. Apparently, they had never seen a woman before. Ariana was tempted to clear her throat when Michael finally broke out of his trance and nudged his brother. I've brought gifts, the perfect princess finally said, breaking the strained silence. After gesturing to a servant Ariana hadn't seen standing at the back of the group, the princess folded her hands and waited patiently as a chest large enough to hold Ariana was dragged up. As a token of my people's hopes for a future of mutual interest. Everyone gasped as it was opened and a pile of gold pieces, pearls, and jewels began to spill out. It made Ariana's little bag of pearls look like a child's collection of rocks. And we are most honored to have you with us. Dina moved swiftly to the princess and took her hand, effectively blocking Ariana from the woman's view. My sons and I were delighted to receive your letter. And who is this? The woman moved around Dina and toward Ariana. Ariana nearly smiled at the rage on Dina's face, but her amusement disappeared as the woman began to look her over. The longer the woman studied her, however, the softer and kinder her brown eyes grew. You, my dear, are lovely, she said in her melodic voice. Oh, yes, Dina hurried to Princess Inessa's side once more. This is my granddaughter's governess. She was actually just leaving to put the girls to bed. Dina turned and glared daggers at Ariana. You would be surprised at the level of improvement she's gained since coming here. When she arrived, she had no home or way of keeping herself. But look at what she's become. A strange look flicked across Princess Inessa's face. She looked almost irritated. But Ariana couldn't be sure, for the expression was gone before Ariana was even sure it was there. Please, Princess Ines turned to Dina, her dark eyes wide and pleading, let her stay with us tonight. I should love to know all of your family. Even your granddaughters if it allows this young woman to stay with us. It was Ariana's turn to stare now. Who was this woman, and why for the love of kelp was she interested in Ariana? To her annoyance, Ariana was quickly finding it difficult to dislike the new princess, despite all her earlier misgivings. Anyone who ruffled Dina had to at least be a tolerable soul. Chapter 30 Dismissed Supper was one of the most confusing meals Ariana had ever eaten. Her desire to dislike the woman and sniff out her motivation for such a sudden proposition warred with her gratefulness for Princess Inessa's kindness to her. For though Dina had consented with a very stiff smile to let Ariana and the girls eat with the select group, Dina made sure to seat them at the far end of the table, as far from the general conversation as they could get. Yet Princess Ines, to her credit, attempted to draw Ariana into the conversation whenever she could, leaning forward and trying to hear her whispers, without even batting an eye at the whispers themselves. But every time Ariana was tempted to toss out her suspicions, Princess Ines would turn her charm on the men. Ariana had never seen such guppies as the men were that night. Lucas, of course, did not surprise Ariana. Lucas loved little more than flirting with every woman he met, but none of the lords were particularly attentive to their wives that night, either. Michael did better than the others. She could see him trying not to gawk, his gaze sometimes resting on the table or the ceiling. 
but every few minutes, he would have to look at the princess for politeness's sake, and he would be enthralled all over again. Ariana was nearly ready to write him off as just as lost as Lucas, when he leaned forward and folded his hands. Princess Ines, he said, perhaps you could tell us a bit about where you're from. His gaze flicked briefly to Ariana. Good. He wasn't completely gone yet. Princess Ines lifted her goblet and swirled its wine about. I come from the Espigmas Isle in the Third Sea. We tend to keep to ourselves, only trading with the mare people when they were still interacting with humans. Since they paid us special heat in their dealings, they told us that it would be best if we stayed hidden. We are a small people with few ships. And gold. Lots and lots of gold. She sighed prettily. Alas, their disappearance has cut off our entire trade supply. When our spies relayed to us that other coastal kingdoms were also suffering, we knew that perhaps we might benefit from also dealing with others. And then, she turned her sweet smile on Michael, we heard that your kingdom had found a way to reignite trade with some of the inland kingdoms. That's when we knew we must immediately make contact. Ariana did the math in her head and her suspicions were raised again. Even with an escort from the Sea Crown, she whispered as loudly as she could, you could not have sent two messages and traveled here within one week from the Third Sea. Such a journey should have taken at least four weeks. Maybe more. I think it is quite rude to question our guest, Dina said, glowering at Ariana. Actually, Lucas lost his annoying smile for the first time that night, Ariana is right. He turned to Princess Ines. How did you relay your messages so quickly? A fair question. The princess took a dainty sip of her wine. I must admit that I have been on the mainland for several months, traveling about so as to learn about your people for my father. Well, you and other coastal kingdoms. I had been in your city for some weeks, posing as a visiting merchant, when news of the pearls spread. I knew immediately that along with everything else I had learned of your people, as you were mostly dependent on the sea like my own people, it was a sign from the Maker. I'm glad to know you've been in our city, Michael said as he put his fork down and glanced at his mother. Dina gave him the slightest shake of her head, but he turned and spoke to the princess anyway. I will not be dishonest with you. You have seen the dismal conditions my people are surviving. We have only just escaped losing everything due to mountainous debts, and our economy is still in shambles after a five-year war that ravaged our harbors and chased away the guardians of our seas. Ariana tensed. Would the princess's beauty cause him to forget and betray her secret? He had kept it well, but Princess Ines was not like everyone else. Even now, Lucas was back to gawking at her over his spiced tuna. Thanks to the brave venture of one of our citizens, Michael continued, omitting Ariana's name, much to her relief, we are still afloat, but only just. I'm afraid I must be impertinent and ask why you believe we could benefit you. There are other coastal kingdoms farther south and a little north, but none are so dependent on the sea. Why us? Princess Ines leaned back in her chair and pursed her lips, giving him an appraising look. Even her thoughtful expression was breathtaking, and Ariana could see Michael's focus waver slightly as the woman stared him down. How can intelligent men such Michael and Lucas be so incredibly stupid? Ariana thought with frustration. What about your part in this war that chased all our sea guardians away? All of Princess Inessa's coy playfulness was suddenly gone. To be blunt, my grandfather acted foolishly, Michael responded. Both sides did, it seemed, but my grandfather would not let the war end, even on his deathbed asking me to continue it for him. My kingdom is a peninsula, and our borders end at the mainland, so to be honest, I do not know what we will do to recover if the mare people do not return. Ariana had been so engaged in the conversation that she didn't even notice the girls beginning to quarrel until Dina snapped her fingers and nodded at the girls to be dismissed. Ariana's face burned as she recognized that she, too, was included in the dismissal. 
Asterisk 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 Ariana had tucked the girls in and was nearly to her own room when clacking footsteps echoed down the hall after her. She braced herself for another lecture and round of threats from Dina, so her surprise couldn't have been greater when she turned to see Princess Ines come round the corner. I hope I didn't get you into trouble. Princess Ines stopped several feet away and wrung her perfect hands. Distress made her look even more beautiful, Ariana noted with disgust. And yet, she couldn't help being touched by the woman's concern. It's not your fault, she whispered. I'm afraid Queen Dina has never much liked me. I just, the woman paused and bit her lip. I hope you see how lovely you truly are, and how much worth you have. No matter how they treat you. Prince Michael and Prince Lucas treat me wonderfully. It is their mother, I'm afraid, who wishes I were gone for good. Yes, Princess Inessa's voice hardened. I see that. She looked down at her flowing green gown and sighed. Well, don't give up hope. I like you already. You say what you mean and you have a kind heart. She beamed. I believe we shall be quite intimate friends. And don't worry about the queen. Between you and me, we shall make sure that Prince Michael and his mother get exactly what they deserve. But I told you, Ariana said, frowning, Michael has been kind to me. Well then, Princess Ines whirled around, her skirts flouncing, he should have nothing to worry about. Thank you for listening to part 3 of Silent Mermaid, a clean fantasy fairy tale retelling of The Little Mermaid. To listen to Silent Mermaid part 4, visit the link in the description below or go to the playlist. If you enjoyed this free audiobook experience, please like this video and subscribe to my channel so you're notified when new free fairy tales are uploaded. Visit BrittanyFictorFiction.com for more fairy tales in ebook, print, and audiobook format. Silent Mermaid, a clean fairy tale retelling of The Little Mermaid. Copyright 2017 Brittany Fichter. All rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced, distributed or transmitted in any form or by any means without the prior written permission of the publisher. For permission requests, write to the publisher at brittanyfictorfiction.com. Edited by Meredith Tennant.